Welcome to Aaron Menke's Cabinet of Curiosities, a production of iHeartRadio and Grim and Mild. Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. After his second term in office in 1797, President George Washington refused to run for a third term. He believed two terms were enough for any president. Every person who took office after him adhered to what was then an unwritten rule about the position. Until Franklin Roosevelt in 1933, each president only served at most two terms before vacating the office. Roosevelt famously won four elections, serving longer than any president before or since. Sadly, he passed away in 1945, not long after his fourth term began. In 1947, the 22nd Amendment was ratified, stating a president could not be elected to office more than twice. Not every president made it to the end of their second term, though. Abraham Lincoln, for example, was the first president to be assassinated while in office. And some didn't even reach the end of their first term. William Henry Harrison lasted only a month into his presidency before dying of typhoid pneumonia in April of 1841. History books claim his was the shortest term on record. But was it? David Rice Atchison might have disagreed. Atchison was born in Lexington, Kentucky in 1807. He grew up a staunch supporter of slavery and eventually the Confederacy during the American Civil War. He wasn't always a political animal, though. Atchison got his start as a lawyer in Missouri. He ran his own practice and gained fame for representing Mormon founder Joseph Smith in a number of land dispute cases. Atchison, though, had grander plans for himself. He rose through the political ranks, first in the Missouri House of Representatives, then as a circuit court judge. In 1843, he became the youngest U.S. senator to ever hail from the state of Missouri. Atchison was so well-liked by his party that they elected him in 1845 as President Pro Tempore. It meant that in the event the elected president and vice president could no longer serve the duties of their office, he would have been the third in line to assume the role. He was 38 at the time. For the next several years, he served as President Pro Tempore without incident. From John Taylor to James K. Polk, the former lawyer from Missouri carried out his job in the Senate, never believing that he would ever ascend to the highest office in the country. Until something strange happened in 1849. You see, before the 20th Amendment of the Constitution was ratified in the 1930s, presidential terms began at noon sharp on March 4th rather than on January 20th, as they are today. On that day, at that time, the previous administration was automatically stripped of all its power, and the new administration assumed those responsibilities. In 1849, though, Inauguration Day happened to fall on a Sunday. Zachary Taylor had just been elected as the 12th President of the United States, but refused to be sworn into office on the Sabbath. Instead, he waited until the following day, March 5th, which meant that the position of President of the United States would be vacant for 24 hours. Not if you were David Rice Atchison, though. With the presidency and vice presidency both empty, that left Atchison as next in line to assume the title. He was president pro tempore, after all. Historians today claim that there was no way Atchison could have been considered president. He was never sworn in, and his position as president pro tempore ended the same day as Polk's administration, even though he was re-elected to the same role once Taylor took office anyway. Atchison didn't sign any executive orders or influence any foreign policy. Any decisions he might have made would have been challenged and likely undone by other governing bodies anyway. The way experts see it, Taylor was president, even before he was sworn in. At worst, the country lacked a sitting president for 24 hours. Still, it doesn't really matter what historians have to say about the matter. Atchison got the last word. It says so right on his grave marker in Plattsburgh, Missouri. David Rice Atchison, President of the United States, for one day. When the people are dissatisfied with their elected officials, they have one of two options. 
They can either vote them out or revolt. But a group of 17th century Dutch citizens managed to come up with a creative third option. The Dutch Republic during this time was an educational and artistic utopia. It also had an army more skilled and powerful than almost any other in Europe. The Republic was presided over by two government divisions, the first of which was the House of Orange, led by William II. The other was the office of the Grand Pensionary, headed by Johann de Witt. Johann and his brother Cornelius were highly educated aristocrats with grand dreams for the future of the Netherlands. Johann, in particular, was a master of political manipulation. He had been elected as the Grand Pensionary and oversaw the Dutch Republic, mainly Holland. Though the people were technically ruled by the House of Orange, it was de Witt who pulled the strings behind the scenes. He was a man of the Republic and constantly at odds with the monarchy, believing that the power they held should have been transferred to the Dutch leaders instead. De Witt's interests were primarily centered on the shipping and trading economies of Holland, which affected and involved the upper class from where he had come, not like the more middle-class-focused House of Orange. Meanwhile, William II was elected as governor of the Netherlands in 1647. He held the title for three years until his death in 1650. Just over a week after his passing, his wife gave birth to an heir, William III. De Witt immediately saw a problem that needed fixing. The people admired the House of Orange. They encouraged the monarchy to elect the infant William III as governor with the help of a regent until he came of age. De Witt wanted to keep the power away from the family by any means necessary. Now, coincidentally, at the same time the Dutch and the English Commonwealth were engaged in war, England had just liberated itself from King Charles I by liberating the king from his head. De Witt saw a way to make peace with England while also keeping William III from becoming governor. He penned a treaty between the two nations called the Treaty of Westminster, which had a clause buried inside it that prohibited William III from being elected governor. The leader of the English Commonwealth, a man named Oliver Cromwell, insisted on this clause, seeing as how William III was also Charles I's grandson and could be a problem for all of them later on. The document was signed. What DeWitt didn't know was that he had also sealed his fate. He worked hard over the next several years to have the position of governor wiped out. His power and influence grew, as did his party. Unfortunately, DeWitt's previous political moves came back to haunt him in 1672. That year, the Dutch Republic found itself under attack from France and England. The Republic fell, and the Orangists took control. And wouldn't you know it, but William III took over as governor anyway, despite De Witt's maneuvering. After a failed attempt on his life, De Witt resigned as Grand Pensionary. His brother Cornelius was arrested by William's forces and sentenced to exile. Before Cornelius was sent out of the country, his brother Johann De Witt wanted to see him one last time. He was on his way to the jail where they were keeping him when an angry mob appeared. They wanted the soldiers to arrest Johann as well. Instead, the guards sort of left, and the mob took matters into their own hands. They dragged Johann and Cornelius out into the open, shot them, and then strung their bodies up in front of everyone. However, the brother's story doesn't end there. The mob wasn't satisfied with only killing them. They felt the two men deserved worse, so a few members of the mob removed and ate parts of their bodies. And amazingly, even after such a public display of violence, None of the participants were ever prosecuted for their crimes, including the cannibalism. In fact, William III made sure that they were all let off. It wasn't the most civilized way to punish elected officials, I know, but it certainly left the crowd feeling happy. And more than a little full. I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com. This show was created by me, Aaron Mankey, in partnership with How Stuff Works. I make another award-winning show called Lore, which is a podcast, book series, and television show. And you can learn all about it over at theworldoflore.com. And until next time, stay curious. Thank you.